which do not interact. So the Hamiltonian is zero, uh, but they have non-trivial statistical properties. That's why they're interesting. When we want to implement them physically, we actually simulate this type of models in the ground state of certain physical models, for example. Uh, and that's exactly what happens with the quantum hall effect. We simulate uh, the topological field theories in the ground state of uh, electron, two-dimensional electron system. Here I will describe something different. We'll pick up a simple model of uh, uh, an ionic model, the Tori code, and we will implement it, we will realize it uh, with photons, with uh, uh, photonic horizontal and vertical polarization uh, of photons. Uh, with this system, we'll be able to demonstrate the fusion properties of the uh, Tori code anions, uh, the braiding uh, properties, the statistics, and also we will see some applications in terms of uh, quantum information applications like uh, uh, quantum anonymous broadcasting and the advantage of having implementing it with a Tori code is that you have the error correcting feature on the top of it and uh, having uh, and this helps you to enhance the anonymity of your protocol so the uh, the experiment was performed at the Max Planck Institute in uh, uh, Garchin in Munich uh, by uh, Harald Weinfutter group and uh, so all these guys um, um, I should acknowledge. And, uh, but before moving into the particular model, let me give a few um, criteria, very much in line to Di Vincenzo's criteria, when you try to implement such systems which have topological order or they are useful for topological quantum computation. That's slightly different things. Uh, so, for example, you will need initialization, and your initial state here is a highly entangled state, right? And this state is entangled, and this entanglement is actually what will bring out the uh, non-trivial statistics of your particles. This, uh, let me remind, uh, uh, emphasize that this is not a property of your topological model. It's a property of the physical model that simulates your topological model. Then you have addressability because you would like, in principle, to generate anions and braid them. And this, uh, uh, and then uh, the measurement comes as a, a measurement outcome after braiding or if you could distinguish the topological entropy, the value of the topological entropy of your system, and so on. And then scalability, as we saw in many um, things, that, that means that you would like to perform as many braidings as you need, uh, so you need a big enough system. Uh, and low decoherence, that means that, of course, topological systems can protect against decoherence, but you need to bring it to a certain level that uh, it can exhibit the topological behaviors you want. Um, the model we'll uh, look at is the Tori code. So as we've already seen earlier on, I won't uh, spend too much time. We have, uh, I have a lattice of qubits, a square lattice, but now the qubits are sitting on the vertices of my lattice. So if I do that representation, it's just equivalent to what we saw earlier on. I have PNS plaquettes. P plaquettes have uh, Z, 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 Z interactions on the four qubits and the uh, S plaquettes, they have X, X, X interactions. Um, the, these operators actually commute with each other and with the Hamiltonian. So their eigenvalue is a good quantum number. And uh, I could diagonalize the Hamiltonian easily. It's exactly solvable. And the ground state is given by this formula. Basically, you have uh, zeros everywhere, and this guarantees that it will be a ground state of the first interacting term. Uh, I have a minus sign in front, so uh, if I have plus one eigenvalues for all of these operators with a minus sign, I go to the lowest possible eigenvalue of the, uh, in the p plaquette operators. And then I project, one projects uh, this state uh, uh, with respect to one plus x, 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 uh, only for the S plaquette. So uh, whenever I have an S plaquette, I apply this projector. And
And this guarantees that the overall state will be uh, a lower state also for this uh, second term, um, so for the S plaquette operators. And uh, uh, so this is a total ground state of the Hamiltonian we saw here. Okay. Now, as we saw, you can generate, you can create anionic states or excitations in the case you have a Hamiltonian by performing individual rotations, like a Z rotation will, does not commute, actually anti-commutes with the uh, S plaquette operators, uh, the XXX I have here uh, and XXX, but it commutes with the P plaquette operators, I have ZZZ here, so it doesn't change their energy. Uh, and vice versa for the X rotations, if I wanted to move this anion from here there, I will perform another Z operation here, and then you get how the story goes. These excitations, so the Z uh, excitations, they live only on S plaquettes, and the X excitations only on P plaquettes. So they're, uh, in a way, they're dual. Uh, but if I uh, braid them, if I actually circulate one around the other, I'll see that they behave as anions. We will see it in a minute. Now, after um, going through this very quickly through this general theory, let me um, reduce my system to the smallest possible that experimentalists could perform in the laboratory, uh, but, and still have some interest, uh, interesting results. Indeed, if you take only one S plaquette depicted here, that is, consists of four qubits, then uh, the Hamil you can take a Hamiltonian to be of that form, so you have the S plaquette interaction, and you're missing the Z plaquettes from here, but you can assume you have certain uh, leftovers from them, Z, Z interactions. And the ground state of, the, uh, of this Hamiltonian, or the ground state as depicted here, in that case of one plaquette, is taking all the qubits to be in the zero state, and then you apply this projector here, okay? And indeed, if you expand it, you see that it is a GHZ state, a four qubit GHZ state. is the version of the Tori code in this uh, minimal system. If you had extend, extended the system uh, attaching P plaquettes uh, uh, neighboring to this S1, then you will have more zeros here, but you won't have a, a projector because a projector only applies uh, to S plaquettes. So that's one generalization you might like to think, but it will not change the physics I'm going to consider here. Right. Now, I would like to generate, so I had the vacuum state, I would like to generate onions and start braiding them. If I apply a Z rotation, we saw that I will create an excitation in the S placket, and then the other excitation will be outside my system. A Z rotation applied on this GHZ state will create, uh, so a Z on qubit one, will create a minus sign between these two terms. And this is what is my anionic state of the system. Now, if you assume that another anion of uh, type X is living outside your system there, or in the placket which corresponds here, then by successive uh, rotations, X rotations, you can move it uh, around your S plaquette, okay? And around the anion which is already there. So apply the X1, X2, X3, X4 uh, on the four qubits. This is sufficient to imprint the path of the anion, of the X anion, uh, on your system. You don't quite need the, the anion itself, but of course you can consider the extended system um, um, easily without changing the physics. If you perform these rotations, then you can easily see that this Z1 rotation anti-commutes with the XXX uh, rotations are performed here. And these XXL rotations, when applied on the vacuum, they give me again the vacuum. You, you, can, uh, you can see it 
uh, here. If I apply xxx, then I will have an interchange of these two terms. So uh, I get a minus sign from this anti-commuting property of z and x, and my final state is minus initial. So if I had bosons or fermions, here I would get a plus sign because I have a full circulation. It's two successive exchanges. Um, so this indicates that I have these uh, two uh, uh, quasi-particles, they, they have anionic character. Now, this is an overall minus sign, and you don't know how to observe it. Uh, you can't observe it straight away as it is. So you have to perform an interference process uh, to bring it out. So consider this to be the ground state, and on it you act with a square root of z. Instead of performing a full z rotation, you perform a square root. So you create, in that way, a superposition between the ground state and the excited anionic state. Or not excited, if you don't have the Hamiltonian, it's just superposition between vacuum and populated anionic state. Then, if you apply the, uh, the uh, string operator or the loop operator, what it happens is that the minus sign is created between the superposition. Then, as a third step, if you apply the inverse z, uh, square root of z rotation, then the final state goes to the uh, anionic state. If there wasn't the minus sign here, the final state will go into the vacuum. So, distinguishing between the vacuum and the anionic state at this final step can tell you if you had the minus sign produced by the braiding or, or not, if you had anionic statistics or not. So these simple steps actually become slightly more complicated if you see them in the lab. And here we see only a small part, the end, uh, the end part of the uh, experiment. Uh, the laser and the parametric down conversion are not here. What you see is the final steps where you have four modes uh, of the, what represent the qubits and the local operations which make the creation of anions and the braidings. Let me show you this picture which uh, speaks more to the brain and to the eyes rather than the previous one. Um, here I have the spontaneous parametric down conversion. I have a strong laser uh, hitting on it and I have a generation of coincidences of two pairs of photons. Then, uh, so at this state, they're both an APR state. Each pair is an APR state. And at the second state, after go this uh, polarizing beam splitter, I managed to create a GHZ state. Now, you split these pairs in four modes with these beam splitters. And only if I have coincidences at the end of, uh, of my detectors that they measured something, then you know that your state was a GHZ state. These local operations there are the X and Z rotations or other manipulations that we need to do that generate anions or braid them. And the amazing thing uh, for the Tori code is that I just need to do these things at the end before measuring. And also, I don't need to interact with the, these qubits. I don't need to interact because all the information, all the uh, properties you encode in the ground state, you encode right here. And that has all the uh, non-trivial statistics there. Uh, the measurement at the end is done by a partial beam splitter that, that uh, splits your beam, in, your photon, either into horizontal or vertical polarization. And if you measure one of the two, you know what the outcome was. So it did repeated the experiment several times while generating these GHZ states, the four qubit GHZ states. And the populations are either all in horizontal or, or all in, in vertical, vertical, vertical. And then you have small populations in, in between steps. So you, you would expect that you have only zeros or only ones which correspond to these two, two uh, columns here, but sometimes you get a mixture, you don't have a 100% clean signal. Uh, and that's because you have, uh, ex except of a component in the GHZ state, you have components in two EPR pairs. And these uh, uh, manifest themselves right there. Uh, the same thing happens if, uh, with the anionic state, you repeat with a minus 
uh, signed there, or you repeat, and you have the populations there. But this is not quite sufficient to tell you that you have a coherent superposition between these two components. So in order to demonstrate that, you do something like a Hadamard rotation, but a more sophisticated one. You take the states out of the vacuum or the anionic state, and you perform a rotation in the uh, xy plane uh, of all the modes simultaneously with respect to the same angle. So all the modes get rotated on the xy plane by an angle gamma. What happens, the, the answer, if you trace this, the answer is that either you get cosine 4 gamma and for the anionic state you get minus cosine 4 gamma. 4 is because you have an entangled state, a GHS state between 4 qubits. If I have a pair of EPRs, then I'll get a two there. So that's a signature that you have a GAZ uh, nature. And the plus and minus, the anti-correlation between these two, tells you if you have a vacuum or an ionic. And remember, I need this distinction between the two because I need to, s to make an interference experiment and see if I have, uh, at the end, a, a vacuum or a an ionic excited state, or populated state, tells me if I got a plus or a minus sign after braiding. And indeed, the vacuum state starts from uh, a positive, it goes negative and oscillates like that. And if you perform the same experiment, but uh, considering the anionic state, preparing the anionic state as with a negative value and then oscillates in an anti-correlated way. So you have a, a, a very good experimental signature to distinguish between the two. That's states we prepared in the lab. Um, the visibility here, if you subtract these two numbers, is 64%, and the fidelity, which corresponds to this visibility and to the previous uh, amplitudes here, is 73%. Actually, uh, very lately repeated the experiment and managed to improve it above 80%. Okay, so, but I don't have the figures for that yet. Now, there is a witness that can distinguish if you have, can tell you if you actually have gen a component into a genuine four qubit GHZ state, if you have entanglement uh, of that type. And this is simply a half minus the fidelity. As long as the fidelity is abo above 50%, that means that you do have uh, a component in this uh, uh, state. So let's start using these properties, these tools we saw, in order to identify, uh, thank you, to identify the fusion rules. If I generate an anion, you see that you go from negative, you start from negative. And so this is the anionic state that you, you recognize at the beginning. So this is a fusion rule vacuum times your anion equals the anion. And a rather, a, a la, rather more uh, non-trivial rule is if you have two anions generating the same placket, that you get the vacuum. And indeed, if you make two applications of Z here and there, you start from positive to negative, and this is a vacuum state at the end. Then the fusion, the non-trivial fusion of a vacuum, which is a string going across and you generate another anion here, is again an anionic state, E, and this goes like this. Now, let's look what happens if you, uh, about the statistics. If I have an empty placket and I move an M anion or an X anion, if you like, around the placket, what you get is a vacuum. If you create a Z anion, you braid this around and you take the Z anion around, again you have the vacuum with a minus sign, but this measurement, as we saw, is not possible to distinguish between the two. And indeed what we do is an interference experiment between these two, so you had a plus sign at the end here, you had a minus here, so if you superpose these two, you actually get, as an answer, the excited state, as we uh, wanted from the interference experiment. Uh, determining that you have anionic statistics. And this, uh, to conclude, uh, we had the properties that four X's acting on the vacuum gives you the vacuum, two Z's acting on the vacuum gives you the vacuum, and that's like a string passing through or passing across. And then you have Z operators acting on the vacuum giving you the excitations, which are all giving you exactly the same state. Doesn't matter where you make the rotation. And actually, these two, uh, properties here are the four qubit GAZ stabilizers. So they uniquely define that the Xi for the, uh, has to be a GAZ state. Why are these interesting uh, for applications? Well, first of all, you could perform 
bottom error correction. And let me uh, pinpoint what experimentalists didn't do here is to do the error correction uh, 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 part. We didn't measure a plaque and correct it. That was possible, but uh, it's, it's very, uh, the, the fidelity goes dramatically down. It would be a very nice experiment for ion traps to do, a very easy for ion trap experiments. Um, and we didn't have the Hamiltonian also here. If you had turned on a Hamiltonian, then you would have a topological quantum memory with its properties. Now, we saw that, the, uh, let me talk about the quantum anonymous broadcasting just a minute, <laughs> if, if I'm allowed. Um, the quantum error correction means that you encode qubits by performing XXX rotations around here or around there, or Z rotations all through a string uh, around your torus. And these are the four qubit states that encode um, that you could decode information, okay? And, um, right. The quantum uh, anonymous broadcasting is, again, you have your toric code, a state defined on a, a torus. So this is a state, okay? I don't have a system here. This is a state. And imagine I cut it uh, in pieces like a donut uh, or, or um, uh, and uh, it's, it's part, a different party takes its part. And the anonymous broadcasting means that somebody performs, a, a votes something, takes a, an answer, okay? And then everybody collects the answers and then uh, uh, somebody measures, okay, what, what happened, who, uh, uh, the votes, and then can say if somebody uh, uh, voted yes or somebody voted no, and give you the answer, but I cannot distinguish who voted what. So that's the anonymous broadcasting. And while classically this is impossible to be done with 100% anonymity, it has been proven that in the quantum realm this is possible. And indeed, how you would implement it with a Tory code, each party takes a piece, and then the one who wants to vote makes a rotation of XXX, for example, around this uh, circum uh, uh, perimeter here. And then you give it to the party who counts the votes. He makes a Z rotation around this way, and he can tell or she can tell if uh, there was a, an onion braiding that way or not. So with a measurement around there, but you cannot tell who did it, okay? Now, being able to demonstrate that, to perform that with a Tory code, allows you to have error correction built on the top of it. So errors actually in the anonymous, uh, quantum anonymous broadcasting destroy the anonymity. The more the errors you have, the more you can distinguish who votes what. So being able to have an, uh, an error correcting code naturally uh, uh, on the top of your system gives you, uh, enhances the anonymity. So I think this is a nice, very nice application of the Tory code that doesn't uh, need the Hamiltonian there. Uh, future extensions, of course, to implement it, uh, larger systems than what we saw, to implement the Hamiltonian, I believe that for one uh, plug it, this is also possible. The Hamiltonian will protect the system from errors to happen. And, uh, and that, that's all. Thank you for your attention. If you have a topological order, okay, that's a property of the state, okay, and you could have <coughs> a, a way to detect topological order is, for example, is a property of a ground state. If you want to do quantum computation, you want to create uh, anionic states and uh, and braid them, and then thank you.